千里之行，始于足下。A journey of a thousand miles begins beneath the feet. We now gather in the Tao to travel the journey together. We are here once again to delve into the Tao Te Ching. Specifically, today we are going to discuss Tao Te Ching Chapter 33. So I think everyone remembers that we went through 33 with the sectional analysis. As I pointed out previously, we have One repeating character that appears in every line, and as you can see, for the first six lines, it appears as the third character, and that is the character for he, who, she, who, those, who, or as I explained previously, it is the er suffix、uh, like walker, flyer, swimmer. And then in the last two lines, those、uh, that particular character appears as the second to last character, as you can see in the character highlighted in red. So previously we went through line by line, from line one all the way down to line six. So those were some pretty interesting、uh, food for thought. We spoke of understanding others, understanding oneself, overcoming others, overcoming oneself, and so on. And we brought in a couple of stories to illustrate those concepts. So, what about the last two lines? Well, one thing we、uh, we can see just by looking at the the Chinese characters is that the last two lines are longer than the other ones. So, line seven, line eight, they both have six characters, where the other ones are either four or five. So it's、uh, one indication that、uh, these two lines go together, and they are talking about a similar topic. So I previously indicated that the last two lines are all about living one's life in the Tao. So today we're going to start by Discussing those ideas in in detail, and I also want to, after we're done with that, I also want to point out for everyone's benefit, there's a there's a hidden structure in the in this particular chapter 33, and the numbering 33 is a little bit fortuitous. 33, the number is composed of two threes, of course. And there are two pairs of three ideas in this particular chapter. So I'll get to that after we do our line by line for line seven and line eight. Line seven says, "Those who do not lose their base endure." So I want to talk about the meaning of that. So as I mentioned just now, this is the the two, the last two lines are all about living in the Tao, living in accordance with the Tao, in tune with the Tao, in alignment with the Tao, congruent with the Tao. So let's talk about this idea of not losing your base. To not lose your base in this context. Means you firmly hold on to the Tao as your foundation. So for for us,、uh, because we just went through Tao Te Ching Chapter 32, I think everyone、uh, remembers. Everyone、uh, still has it pretty fresh in the memory. That in 32 we talked about specific ways of holding on to the Tao. What 32 said was that. 
if you if you are able to hold on to the Dow, then it will rain, quote unquote, sweet dew, which toward the very end of the chapter uh, was also synonymous being like a vast ocean receiving from all the different rivers of the world. So here we have yet another way to talk about the benefits of holding on to one's Dow cultivation. The very last character here, Jiu, is translated as endure in the context of being lasting, in the context of being long lasting like the Tao. So this is a reference to the nature of the Tao being eternal. So if you are able to live in alignment with the Tao, in tune with the Tao, congruent with the Tao, in accordance with the Tao, then you too can be as lasting as the Tao. Now, of course, human life is finite. So we're all going to be leaving sooner or later. We're going to have to all leave this behind. And that is the reason why the next line is going to talk about the true meaning of lasting or longevity. Uh, even, in a sense, immortality. Now, before we actually get to that, I want to draw everyone's attention to the other context of lasting. It's not just lasting in terms of other people's memories of you. This is lasting in every context, which includes excellent physical health. Now, it is, I think, fairly well known that those who live in accordance to the Tao can also use the Tao to enjoy excellent health. Not only that, but as you head into your elder years, senior years, you find that using the Tao to live your life results in holding on to mental acuity holding on to be as sharp mentally as you ever were. And you can do this throughout your entire lifetime. Now, the specifics uh, warrants a much more detailed discussion than we have time for today. Uh, and what I have talked about previously was to be uh, mindful of what you consume. Um, People uh, often assume that I would advocate vegetarianism, etc. Uh, what instead, what I usually say is that you want to be aware, you want to be clear of exactly what it is you are taking in. And the clearer you are, the more you will steer yourself in the right direction. Nowadays, the right direction oftentimes is a reduction in the consumption of meat. So that sort of corresponds with the overall vegetarian or vegan position. Um, but that's not what I actually advocate. I only say to be aware. You always want to know exactly what it is you are doing. So nutrition is one aspect of it. Exercise uh, would be another aspect of it. So that can also be done in accordance to the Tao. And when I mention that, you may think that I mean qigong or tai chi. Well, yes, those are, those are excellent, but it doesn't have to be that. It could just be plain everyday exercise. It could be as simple as walking, which is wonderful. It could be other forms of exercise that you decide to take on. It could be push-ups every day. Why not? So all of those can be done with the Tao. Holding on to the Tao means that you will enjoy great health. So anyone who's interested, let me know. We can have a much more in-depth discussion on that. Uh, for now, though, I want to just touch on the topic so we can move on to the next line, which is the last line. So the previous line, we talked about physical health, physical longevity. The final line is specifically addressing that. Longevity, what does it really mean? So first realization when we talk about longevity is that 
everyone lives to a different age. So someone may pass away at the age of 80 or 90 or 70, 75, 85, etc. Well, who knows what is in store for you? And what is longevity? If everyone is passing away at a particular age and it's all different, then what is the definition of longevity? So in order to answer that question, Lao Tzu suggests that we separate ourselves from the concept of a numerical number of years, a numerical concept which uh, perhaps mandates that if you live more than X number of years, then you are said to be long living or longevity. And, uh, you know, we in our culture, we, we celebrate centennials. We celebrate people who make it past the, the 100 years milestone. Uh, and yet, Lao Tzu looks at it more deeply and figures out a more basic truth, which is that, well, what if you do live to 100 years, but for instance, those years are spent in misery or those years are spent in monotony. What if you do not fulfill your potential? You're just uh, surviving day to day. Uh, what if you are not able to utilize your full faculties, etc.? These are all factors we need to take into account. So, Lao Tzu ultimately settles on the concept of longevity that is not uh, tied to the number of years that you live. Because what good is longevity if you have no idea what to do with yourself, right? So here's what Lao Tzu would, uh, would say. Here's what Lao Tzu will try to express. To die but not perish means the memory of you lives on for everyone long beyond physical death. And more importantly, this is the result of living a memorable, meaningful life, regardless of its length. So the length could be relatively short, but if it is long in meaning, in being memorable, in contribution to the world, to others, in being of service, then that is actually a better kind of longevity than just a simple number of years. So think about, as we look around in the world, as we look around at other people, think about the, the commonality, the common affliction that retirees often will suffer. That is, for many people, for many retirees, without work to give them structure and purpose. They are adrift. And suddenly, being cast adrift, having no compelling reason to go on, they deteriorate. So I want to suggest that that would not be the Tao. The Tao would be a lifelong enjoyment of excellent health, engagement in the activities that are most meaningful to you. So we're gonna get into those details in just a moment. For now, the important thing is to understand the concept. Living a life that is long in terms of years, but unremarkable in terms of purpose and contribution to the world, that is actually not the Tao. Just simply living longer, that doesn't mean anything. So there's a little bit more to that. How do you live a life of meaning? At this point, I want to remind everyone of something that we've talked about quite a bit recently, and that is every chapter of the Tao Te Ching wraps around the end, goes back to the beginning. And if you want to make sure that you understand a particular chapter, all you have to do is to ask, ask yourself this question. At the end of this chapter, how does it connect back to the beginning? If you are able to answer that question, then yes, you have a good understanding of the chapter. In this case, we want to tie the very last line 
uh, which is about living a life full of meaning so that you die physically, but, but you do not perish. You continue on in everyone's thoughts and minds. So how do we, how do, we do that? This is, where, uh, this is where the end of this chapter ties back to the beginning. So the beginning of the chapter, I think uh, you may recall, we talked about knowing, understanding other people, and understanding yourself. So the message there, which uh, if you remember, uh, illustrated with the puzzle of the warrior, that is the hidden message of this particular chapter that in order to live a life of the Tao, in order to live in the Tao, you must attain an understanding of yourself. So simple, yet I think also very profound. In the puzzle of the warrior, the story that you heard, or the puzzle that you heard, and hopefully uh, the solution at the end made a lot of sense to you. If you remember, to understand yourself is to understand the power of your self-determination, that you should not give up that power to any external factors, external factors like secular authority, the authority of the hierarchy, or religious authority, the authority of religious institutions. Nor should you give up that power to the lure, the seduction, the attraction of money or monetary gain. You should hang on to that power for yourself, and that's symbolized by the warrior wielding the sword. The sword is the symbol for the power to decide. So no following external factors blindly, no giving up your power. So that is the hidden message of Tao Te Ching 33. You can see it quite plainly if you connect the last part with the first part to have a wrap back. And speaking of a uh, hidden message, we've gone through the chapter line by line, and now I want to talk about this underlying structure that may not be so obvious at first glance. So you could say that it's kind of a hidden structure too. And there's quite a bit to talk about, uh, some of which we have already covered, but we haven't covered absolutely everything. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and do that. That's, the, that's my primary goal of today, is to talk about that, that structure. So first, I want to uh, bring back the chapter, uh, the translation, and I'm highlighting just a specific character. So having gone through the chapter, I think everyone knows what that, chap what that particular character means, right? So you see it as the first character in line one, second character in line two, and you see it again as the first character in line five. And if you check on the translation, you quickly see, hopefully you can see, that the character zhi means to understand or to know. So I have it at the top of the slide. So this is to know or understand something, but in three parts. What are the three parts? Well, the three parts as you see here. We start with the first two lines, and there is the understanding of others, there is understanding of the self, and there is also, in line five, the knowing, the understanding of contentment. So those are the knowing or understanding in three parts. That's one side of it. There is another aspect to, uh, to this hidden structure that I am alluding to. Here's what it looks like. So you'll see these two characters, the first character in line three, the second character in line four. So these uh, you can see are translated as overcome. Shen is the pronunciation in Mandarin, Shen. It means to win, to attain victory. 
And therefore, overcoming others is to have a win over other people. Overcoming yourself is to win over yourself. So the last set of three, we had the same character occurring in three lines, one, two, and five. This time, we seem to have just two, three, and four. So what is the other one? Well, the other one is right below. Shenren, overcome others. Zishen, overcome themselves. And then the final character here provides the missing link. The last character, Qiang, means powerful. It appears as the beginning of line six. So this is the other part. Therefore, in looking at this particular chapter, uh, a Tao master who really understands it in great depth will say, this chapter speaks of the truly wise and the truly strong. That is, spiritually wise and someone who is full of spiritual authentic strength. The person who is spiritually wise, truly wise, is someone who understands others and themselves and also understands contentment. So understanding in three parts. And the truly powerful, spiritually powerful, the truly strong, spiritually strong, is the person who attains victory in three aspects. That is victory over other people, victory over themselves, and by living a life in accordance with the Tao, victory ultimately, victory as the ultimate attainment in living a life of the greatest triumph. So this is the other part. Let me lay them out for you. So it's a little clearer. Starting with the zhi, the knowing or understanding of three parts. As you have seen, it starts out with understanding others. This is knowledge of human nature, the knowledge about the way people are, the Tao of humanity, if you will, to understand that aspect of it, that part of it. This is followed, as you recall, by understanding yourself. So this is all about self-awareness. This is reflecting upon your own actions, your own destiny. And then, lastly, there's also the knowing, understanding of contentment. And this means to understand the meaning of contentment. And it, it has to be just, it has to be not just an intellectual understanding, a rational understanding of, of the concept. It's got to be more. In the Tao, there is always more. It's got to be to live in contentment, to be immersed in contentment, to feel it, to feel it for yourself. So this is the first part of the hidden structure, the three aspects of knowing. And then let's talk about the three aspects of victory or triumph. This is the other part of the hidden structure, to overcome others. Overcoming others is a public victory that can be seen by everyone. So this is more externally directed. This is more something that people can see. This is like a public ceremony, perhaps an award ceremony where you are being honored. Now that's one kind of victory. What about the other kind? The kind where you overcome yourself. This is more difficult. It is also much less visible. It is much more private in that the difficulty uh, is something that other people cannot perceive, cannot appreciate. It's a private victory known only to you and those closest to you. So only yourself and friends and loved ones will possibly know the extent to which you have struggled with something and then attain a private victory over that. So the public and private victories. Then, lastly, to proceed vigorously, Xing, a life well lived is the ultimate victory, the greatest triumph of all. So today, before we get to the paraphrase, I want to make sure 
that we cover the hidden structure with examples, and we've already started doing that last time. So here's what I mean. Let's start with the first part of it, which is the knowing or understanding in three parts. This other slide, the understanding others and understanding yourself and then no contentment. Last time, you remember that we went through the puzzle of the warrior and the point to be made there was that you have to understand the true self you have to wield the power to decide. Understanding yourself implies that you accept this power, this authority that you have over your own destiny. Seizing control of that, wielding the sword, means you are able to make meaningful decisions for yourself, to direct the course of your actions, live a life in accordance to the Tao, and enjoy having that power. Last time, we also talked about knowing contentment. So everybody, I think you may recall, if you listened in last time, or perhaps heard the recording in YouTube, you remember the story about this lady who, despite being handicapped, understood, knew, and felt contentment, that there was a joy radiating out of her. So using her as an example, the rest of us really have no excuse not to be able to have the same understanding, the same knowledge, and feeling for contentment. So these are the two from last time. And looking at this right now, I, I think you can see that, well, it would be kind of nice if we can fill in the blanks here and have some sort of graphic for understanding others as well. So this is what I want to uh, talk to everyone about today. And I think this can be a, a very interesting topic for us. So for those of you who weren't here uh, previously, um, the graphic in the middle is the puzzle of the warrior. That has been, uh, thanks to Mark, he has isolated that story by itself. And it's, uh, it's a, a shorter YouTube recording that is in the YouTube channel. And then the graphic at the bottom, that's a story called So Lucky. So Lucky was the favorite phrase of this lady who lived a memorable life that had a powerful effect on others. Okay, so what about understanding all the people, the first one, the missing graphic? Well, yeah, there is a story in the, tr the Tao tradition about that, too. So to get into that, that story, I want to make sure that we delve into this topic by comparing conventional thinking with Tao cultivation. Starting out with conventional thinking. Understanding other people. So for most society, understanding people in general is already an accomplishment. Reason why that is, is because there are plenty of us, plenty of us who lack a good understanding of other people. And indeed, when we first started out life, can you remember when you were a teenager, when you were younger, when you were relatively clueless? You look back on those days, you realize that you were naive, so, for instance, perhaps you had a hard time figuring out how people really were. What was their true character? Perhaps you had a hard time assessing that. Perhaps you had a hard time as a naive youngster. You had a hard time perceiving hidden agendas. So I remember those days for myself as a younger person, certainly as a teenager. So here's an example. As you go through life, you will encounter a lot of people and some of them will flatter you. Some may lavish praise upon you and it makes you feel great. It feeds your ego, it hypes you up, it swells up your head 
and perhaps it was done for a specific reason. Perhaps that person butters you up for a particular reason because they want something from you. They want to make a request of you, ask you about something, ask for something as an example. So it certainly pays for us to be able to understand other people. So this is a useful skill to have. Now let's talk about Dow cultivation. Here I have a question for everyone. And I'm going to be very upfront and label it as a trick question. Trick question, this chapter, you know, at the beginning, the first two lines, Lao Tzu basically says, knowing others is intelligent, which is fine. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's a good thing. It's a positive thing. But real wisdom is the next line, which is knowing yourself. So the trick question is, with this chapter, is Lao Tzu telling us to focus on understanding the self instead of understanding others? Isn't Lao Tzu telling us that understanding the self is the greater wisdom compared to understanding others? What is Lao Tzu trying to say? What do you think? I'll pause for a moment so you can respond with your thoughts. So the question once again is whether or not Lao Tzu intends for us to focus on understanding ourselves and not spend the time and effort or so much time and effort trying to understand other people. So it's a trick question because it may seem that way given some interpretation of the first two lines in the Tao, remember one thing whenever i ask you to choose from one or the other understand the others understanding the self a or b or under or choose one thing out of a multitude x or y or z that in the Tao can always be seen as a trick question because I may not be presenting you with the option of choosing both or choosing none. If you recall in our previous installment, the puzzle of the warrior was in choosing the king, the high priest, or the rich man. And the real answer was none of them was choosing oneself. One self was the highest authority, not the king, not the high priest, not the rich man. So here's the answer that I want to offer to you. No, although understanding yourself is greater than understanding others, a Tao cultivator wishes to master both, both understanding other people and understanding yourself both externally and internally for both the external aspects of life and the internal aspects of life they are all part of the Tao they're all part of Tao mastery so how do we attain a better understanding of other people mastery begins when you start paying attention to the way we communicate with one another so there's a story about that. This is a story. This is one of the stories that I published in the Tao of Daily Life called Xin Zai. Xin means heart or mind. Zai means fasting or vegetarian diet. It comes from this particular story written by Zhuang Zi. Yan Hui Qing Xing. Uh, let me decipher the Chinese characters down here for you. Yan Hui, the two, first two characters, and this is read from left to right. The first two characters, this is the name of the number one disciple, the senior disciple, the top student of Confucius. This image that you see here shows Yan Hui to the left, Confucius to the right. So 
the story of Shinzai actually comes from a longer story where uh, the disciple is visiting with the master and they had a discussion. And this was written by Zhuangzi, uh, who came after them uh, by about a century. So back in those days, the master-disciple relationship, it was customary in such a relationship that if the disciple is planning to go on a trip, especially a long journey, that prior to taking on that journey, he would visit with his master to have the master understand exactly what his plans are and then request permission to leave. So this is why at the top of the slide, you see disciple requesting leave. It's what happened when the disciple visited with Confucius and reported on what his plans were to go to the kingdom of Wei and what his intentions were once he got there. So in that story, the disciple Yan Hui visited Confucius to request permission and if permission was granted to bid farewell. So he told his master where he was going, the kingdom of Wei. At that time, it was a chaotic, um, a dangerous land. So Confucius naturally wanted to know why he was going there what his plans were once he got there. So the disciple reported to the master that he had heard about the chaos, the strife in that kingdom due to the king of that kingdom, the king of Wei, Wei who was quite a tyrant. So the people were suffering. There, there were dead bodies everywhere and the king didn't care. He did not value human life. He waged war endlessly. So he felt compassion. He wanted to do something about that. So that's the reason why he wanted to go. So he reported to Confucius that, Master, you taught us to treat a chaotic nation as a doctor treats someone who is sick or injured. So I feel that I should make an attempt. I should go there, talk to the king, and maybe steer him in the right direction, a direction that would be much easier for the people of that kingdom, for the subjects of that kingdom. Then uh, Confucius launched into a lecture to explain to him why this was a bad idea. So the talk, the back and forth between the two of them had a lot of details. When I wrote my story for the Tao of daily life, I had to simplify it quite a bit in order to convey the main point without losing people on my way of getting there. So one day I'm gonna have to do a more proper rend rendition of all the complexities in that particular exchange for now, though, I'll just add a little bit more so you can see the missing pieces. You can see the congruence that uh, Confucius demonstrated to the Tao. So Confucius said to his disciple, his top student, he said, you have a tendency to make things complicated. That is not good. And I'm, of course, paraphrasing the modern vernacular. Uh, Confucius didn't talk exactly that way. I'm trying to convey what he talked about. Confucius told his disciple, you see, the Tao is simple. The Tao is not complex. And in the Tao, it is important to stick with the basics, the simplicity of the basics. That is, you want to establish a firm, firm footing for yourself before you attempt to help other people, to reach out to other people and you know, bring them to their feet. Well, first you have to have that firm footing. You have to hold on to your base, your foundation, so to speak. So basically Confucius is saying that, well, you, my students, you don't really know what you're doing yet. 
So you don't really have the ability to help other people effectively. And besides, Confucius said, it's difficult because when people don't know you, they don't know who you are. They have no idea what you're capable of. Thus, they have no reason to listen to you. And if you reveal the extents of your knowledge, for instance, if you engage other people in discussions and maybe even debate against them, well, they know, they know about you now, they begin to know about you, they know about how much you know, this can invite contention, jealousy, sabotage. So whether people know something about you or not, it, it's gonna be difficult. So with this particular tyrant, he's strong-willed, he's a bully. The second you open up your mouth in front of him, he will dominate you with his power. And think about it, there have been so many examples throughout history of good men who risked their lives going up to the king, the ruler, to give them wise advice. And look how many of them have lost their lives. Remember, these ancient kings of ancient China, they had absolute power. They could order anyone's execution at any time and suffer no repercussion, no negative consequence. So the disciples said, well, I can keep it simple. I can stick to the basics, like you're pointing out, and I can let the king know in a simple and direct way. So Confucius says, well, that's a bad idea because this particular ruler, the king of Wei, is a willful man, not accustomed to being contradicted. So the likely reaction to the direct approach will be to push back. And there won't be anything you can do about that. And if you yield to the king, it will only add to his domination. It's like setting a house on fire, making things worse. And for this particular king, we already know that for him, even a gradual change, like a little bit at a time, even that is impossible. So never mind you trying to effect a drastic change instead of a gradual change in him and therefore in his kingdom. So Yan Hui says, so instead of the, the simple, basic and direct approach, uh, I, should, I, should be, I should use the indirect approach. I should appear to yield and uh, subtly steer him in the right direction. I will use examples from the past. I will use traditions rather than my own thoughts and ideas. So I can be totally honest, but avoid a confrontation, me against him. So Confucius still thought that this plan would not work. He said, well, this plan is slightly better than your previous plan because at least you will survive the experience. At least you won't lose your life. Perhaps you will be jailed. So the bottom line is that you won't be able to produce any significant change in that land. So the, the, the ego of this particular king will only be boosted by your approach. He will, be, he will be even more convinced that he's right. So by now, by this point, the disciple is totally out of ideas. So can use the direct approach, can use the indirect approach, so he is like, well, there's no other way then, master. What other way is there? That's when Confucius said, you have to go about it with xin zai. So xin zai is the concept that Confucius wished to teach to his students. And I have it as the top two characters here. So initially the disciple was confused. Xin means the heart or the mind. Zai meant fasting or a vegetarian diet. So disciple Yan Hui said to Confucius, well, master, 
uh, I come from a very poor background, so I've already gone through quite a few months uh, without alcohol and without meat. So I'm already on zai, the vegetarian diet. Then Confucius says, well, zai, the vegetarian diet, or fasting, that's about cleansing the body. That's about cleansing the physiology. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about cleansing your mind. I'm talking about approaching with without preconceptions, preconceived notions, clearing your mind so that you can be much more effective, so that you can achieve your purpose. So let me uh, lay out those characters for you. Xinzai. And remember, in pinyin, the X is always SH. So xin zai, literally heart or mind. And the second character, fasting or vegetarian diet. So the reason why this comes up for communication is because this is the technique that Confucius taught his disciple to communicate with the tyrant. And he's trying to save his disciple's life. So as you have heard, Xinzai means you must clear your mind of preconceptions and agendas in order to really listen and understand. So the other problem with all the attempts that there has been in the West to render the Xinzai concept is a lack of practical clarity. What I mean is, um, okay, you're telling me that there is a powerful way to communicate that will allow me to change someone who seems impossible to change, the tyrant, someone who's so much more powerful than regular everyday people. So there's this powerful technique, but how can I apply that to my life? Today, I want to do exactly that. I want to talk about how to apply it to your life with some practical real life examples. First, I want to direct everyone's attention at communication all around you, the way that people talk to one another, the way that we talk to others, the way others, other people talk to us. So notice how people are full of themselves when they converse. Tell me if you have heard the following before. When you talk about something that happened, have you heard this? Yeah, the same thing happened to me the other day. Haven't you heard this many times? Or you tell someone about what's going on and something that you decided to do or not do, and you will hear something similar to, listen, when I was your age. So, Sounds familiar, right? So there's a commonality between the first and the second one. Let me continue on. You can also hear whenever people uh, are talking, you can also hear something like this. Here's what I would do if I were you. And then blah, blah, blah. Here's what I would do, X, Y, Z, A, B, C. And then one more example. Well, I think you are only doing that because blah, blah, blah. So I want everyone to look at these four examples and notice how this kind of communication is all about me, myself, and I. And if you pay attention to when other people speak or when people are talking to you, you will hear this often and you will also hear it from yourself because when you are not aware of this happening, the ego uh, intruding into your conversation, uh, you will not notice it. But once you start paying attention though, you notice it everywhere. So this is not Xinzai. Xinzai, the idea is to clear your heart and mind of this kind of egocentric, me only, me, myself and I type of expression. 
this is uh, some people call this autobiographical communication because you are filtering everything the other person says through your autobiography what happened to me before what i think about xyz the judgment that i pass on so and so it's all about the self uh, in terms of the self-centric ego so with xinzai when you listen with xinzai instead of being full of yourself you clear your mind of self-centric notions like what you want to say next your opinion on everything etc so what happens next when you do that is it naturally shifts your focus from your ego to the other person you are no longer filtering everything through your autobiography this also shifts your communication from self-expression to a pure intent to understand so this is the beginning of what confucius was teaching his students let's take a look at how differently you come across what you say to the other person will change accordingly for instance you will hear something like what do you mean by things not going well? Okay, so this is the response to someone telling you that things are not going well. When you say, what do you mean by that? Tell me more. Give me more details. It's not about you. It's about them. It's about attempting to understand more by going deeper and being clearer. Another example, when they tell you about something, well, how do you feel about that? You are, again, trying to deepen your understanding of the other person by figuring out their feelings and emotions about a particular topic. It's not about you, it's about them. Another example, so have you thought about the next steps? Like, so what are you gonna do? Do you have any plans? So again, it's not about you anymore, it's about them, it's not about well, what I would do if I were you, okay, well, that's about you, but what are you going to do? It's about them. Similar uh, direction of conversation, but entirely different in feeling. And one more example. So how is this affecting the other aspects of your work? When they talk about something that's troubling them, something that perhaps is troublesome, and you are concerned about its effect on the other aspects of their lives. You are demonstrating concern. You are demonstrating an attempt to understand. So these are some examples of what happens when you clear your minds and thoughts of self-centric notions, the ego. The result, the other person feels heard. What a concept, right? It would be great if the other person can feel heard, respected, well regarded as if you hold them with a degree of importance in your mind. And most importantly, the other person feels understood. So this is in practical reality. This is how Xinzai shows up in personal communication. So it, this is only step one, there's a step two. Step two is this, when you establish a real understanding with someone, there's a con you've strengthened a connection between you and this other individual, the natural side effect is your ability to influence others goes way up. And in the Tao, you're not specifically trying to exert influence you're just trying to do the right thing to understand the other person understand where they're coming from but as a natural side effect your ability to exert influence goes way up this is why confucius taught it to his disciple because as he pointed out 
it was dangerous to, uh, to approach tyrants. You could easily lose your life. But if you go there with the intention to understand, having established an authentic understanding, you then open up the possibility to influence. So this is a powerful technique and you can apply it to your life to, I would say, dramatically improve your interactions with other people. So I'm glad we had a chance to talk about that. This is going to uh, complete our slide in the three aspects of knowing or understanding. And uh, as you can see, an image of Confucius and his disciple joins the others in this collection. So I'm going to park it on this slide. We've actually come to the middle part of our of our meeting. So we're about to take a five minute break. I hope you enjoy that story. And I hope you understand how to apply that story to your life. As you would probably expect, we are now looking at the other slide, the three aspects of victory. So as you recall, we have overcoming others or to attain victory over other people. And then we have overcoming yourself and then we have proceed vigorously. So these are the three aspects. We're gonna start one by one by talking about all three, uh, starting with this whole idea of overcoming other people. So you may think that this public victory may not be in accordance to the doubt because it's all about conflict, contention. True, it is uh, not uh, congruent with the peaceful Tao. But I think you also remember when we talked about the Tao of peace, we talked about how the ability, the ability and the willingness to engage in battle as a last resort was very much part and parcel of the Tao cultivation. So you want to always manage your life to avoid it, and yet you also want to be ready if it does occur despite your best effort. When it comes to battles, fighting, combat, in the Tao, there is the long standing tradition of looking back on all the great warriors throughout history and the Tao philosophy that they follow. This is a good time to pull up Sun Tzu, uh, what in English uh, people often refer to as Sun Tzu. So here in this slide, you see an image of his statue. So what he's holding in his hand, that's a scroll, because back in his days, uh, paper hadn't been invented yet. So what he had to write had to be written on a scroll of bamboo strips. And this was the uh, what we in, in the West would call the art of war, or sometimes the ancient art of war. Uh, in, in Mandarin, it is not the art of war at all. In Mandarin, it is Sun Zi Bing Fa, which means Sun Zi, Sun Tzu, apostrophe S, and then Bing Fa, military and principles. So it is Sun Zi, it's the uh, military principles of Sun Tzu. That's what the original title really was. There's no art um, in there. There's no war. There's just uh, military, being as in army. So the title that we have, the title everyone knows, the title that we use all the time to refer to it, it's actually a mistranslation. 
So there's a there's a phrase that I want to highlight for everyone's attention. 知己知彼，百战百胜 So I want to delve into the meaning of this and not、uh, spend too much time on the individual characters.、Uh, the mo the most important thing for us today is to get these concepts rather than to know the characters. So it's basically Eight characters divided into two parts. Each part has four characters. So I'm going to break down each line, line by line,、uh, character by character, and to, so you can get an idea of what it means. So the first line, 知己知彼 no self, no opponent. Literally, the the character there, 知 You you see that it's actually the same character as what we have from thirty three. Know the self, and that means to know your own side, and then know the other side. Know, have detailed awareness of the other side.、Uh, what are their strengths? What where are they weak, etc. If you know what. Your side can do, and you know about the other side. Then that knowledge will translate into the second set of four characters: 百战百胜 hundred battles, hundred victories. So that's usually translated as you will win a hundred times out of a hundred, or you will win all the time, or you will have you know perfect victories, etc. This is a popular phrase in modern Mandarin, and the meaning,、uh, as we have talked about, if you know your side, the strengths and weaknesses of your fighting force, as well as the other side, then you will always win. Always win.、Uh, specifically, it says hundred battles, hundred victories. A hundred battles, comma a hundred victories. So, what people may not know,、uh, even people who speak. Modern Mandarin. What people may not know is that this is actually not the original expression from Zhuang, from、uh, Sunzi. It's a, a distorted version of the original. So here's the original. It says the the first part、uh, you will see is the same. The first four characters is the same as the popular saying, and then the last two characters are different. The, the last two characters basically mean no danger. So if you know yourself and、uh, know your side and the other side, then you will be in no danger in a hundred battles. Is what the original actually says. And a further interpretation of that is that to be in no danger means to be in no danger of losing. Which would be the same, which would seem to suggest the same as a hundred victories out of a hundred battles. So they are at least very similar. So it's interesting that the first part of this quote from Sun Tzu, Sun Tzu, corresponds with the first two points of the previous mini summary. You know, knowing, understanding others, and understanding yourself. This is one way that you can tell the ancient sages. They all drew from a common source, even if they lived centuries apart. In this case,、uh, Sun Tzu actually uh, predated、um, Zhuang Tzu quite a bit. So we can utilize this element, the Sun Tzu Bing Fa, in our attempt to depict the Tao of overcoming others. I think you would agree that this will be a, a very suitable way of using、uh, Sun Tzu's teachings. So that means we can have Sun Tzu in this position, and now we can work on the other parts, overcoming yourself, and to proceed vigorously. So what can we do to talk about this whole idea? Of overcoming yourself. Specifically, let's、uh, let's go to that. Let's focus on it as a topic on its own, and then let's talk about conventional thinking versus Tao cultivation. 
again, we begin the same way as we do with communication. We pay attention to what's happening all around us. And we can see a lot of people giving themselves plenty of excuses. So this is, again, things that you have uh, I'm positive uh, you have heard in your day-to-day -day life. So when it comes to procrastination, tell me if you have heard this before. Uh, no big deal. I'll get to it tomorrow. Maybe you have said it a few times. You have certainly heard it from other people. You know, when it's uh, something that needs to be done, procrastination kicks in and no big deal. I'll get to it tomorrow. And when it comes to addiction, that's yet another thing that we have to overcome. Procrastination is something that many, many people, including myself, we need to overcome that. That's overcoming the self, or at least one aspect of it. Addiction is another aspect of it. Uh, fortunately, the only thing I'm addicted to is uh, coffee. But other people may be addicted to something much more serious. And when it comes to addiction, tell me if you have heard of this before. I can quit anytime I want, right? So this is yet another, this is yet another excuse that people give themselves, especially when it comes to addictive behavior. Nah, I can, I can quit anytime I want. And then I want to bring up another one, stagnation. What I mean by stagnation is Lack of self-improvement, lack of progress in creating a better version of yourself, whether that's physically, mentally, or spiritually. And the excuse given, which I'm sure you've also heard, I'm totally fine with the way I am. So perhaps you have heard someone who's out of shape and knows it, but will say this. I'm totally fine with the way I am. So in private moments, they may admit to themselves that indeed they're not totally fine, but they're putting on a brave face, talking to other people, not wanting to admit it. So they say they're totally fine. So these, as I'm sure you are aware, these are all self-deluding lies. I'll get to a tomorrow. While well, there is always another tomorrow, there is a tomorrow after tomorrow, and then there is another one after that. I can quit anytime I want, while well, the time to quit never quite arrives. And then lastly, denial is a river in Egypt. So that's just an expression. I'm not sure how many people have heard this. Uh, it just means that you are in denial. <clears throat> so this, this is so prevalent. This behavior is so common that I wanted to prepare another slide to compare and contrast between someone who thinks in the conventional way and someone who is engaged in the Tao. So these are further examples of how we face similar challenges in life. To the left, we have conventional thinking. To the right, we have Tao cultivation. So conventional thinking would be saying things like, I would love to, but I just don't have the time. Haven't we heard this from many people? People are always having a shortage of time, right? As a cultivator of the Tao, I need to challenge everyone to say something different. This is important, so I'll make time for it. So obviously it would depend on what this is. You may indeed come up with things that are not important, in which case you're gonna to want to turn your attention to something that's more important. But the, what I'm trying to say here is that even for the important big things in life, plenty of people will go left and say, I would love to but I just don't have the time. If it's truly important, a Tao cultivator recognizes that. 
and we'll make it happen. We'll make time for it. So what's another one? Let's go for another one that most people say. When they want to create an excuse, when they want to not do something, they may say, I have no idea how to do anything like that. Like that is totally beyond me. So does anyone have any suggestions as to what a Dow cultivator would say instead of I have no idea how to do anything like that? Here's my suggestion. I can do some research to figure out how to do it. That research can point you in the right direction, even if it doesn't give you all the answers right away. And it would be surprising or rare if that does occur. Even if you can't figure out the answer, it'll give you, the research will give you leads to follow experts to ask, to approach. One way or another, there is something that you can do. So a Dow cultivator for something truly important would not stop that. Well, I don't know how to do it, so I'm not going to do it. <clears throat> Here's another favorite excuse for not doing something. I'm too old to start. Has anyone heard that? Hopefully not from yourself. The Dow cultivator will say, now is a good time to start. So let me, let me, um, let me say that there are many things in life that when you look at it, the best time to start would be like 10 years ago. You know, in which case you will be reaping the rewards today after 10 years. Many things in life are like that. In my case, it would be something like uh, learning a musical instrument. The best time to start would be many, many years ago. Now, if it's truly important, though, the second best time to start is now. And I can make an argument that it's actually the best time because 20 years ago, 10 years ago, any number of years ago is disqualified from being chosen on the basis of me not being able to go back in time. So it's not the best. It's the best in a sense that if I could go back in time, it would be the best. But since I can't, the best time is now. So here's another one. Here's another excuse that people say to avoid challenging themselves. I don't have that kind of luck. So rather than to embark on a great journey of discovery or to do something with their lives, to accomplish something, something that other people have accomplished, someone may resist doing it because, well, you know, I don't have that kind of luck. A Dow cultivator would say something different, and I think you can guess what that is. I'll make my own luck. Luck is something that you can create. So what else? I don't have that kind of luck reminds me of this one. I don't have that kind of money. So what do you say to that? Uh, I'll make my own money. Well, okay, that's, uh, that's fine. Uh, but here's what I would suggest. More generally speaking, uh, here, not having that kind of money, is, it's really talking about a shortage of resources. Money is a kind of resource. It's a financial resource. But the idea is that the Dow cultivator will say, well, I'm going to create the resources that I need. I won't be stopped with the thought that, well, I'm not going to do it because I don't have that kind of money. Instead, I'm going to resolve to create what I need. Lastly, 
this is uh, one of my favorites. You know, when people are late, well, you know, there's nothing anyone can do about the traffic. On the face of it, it seems to be quite true, but the Dow cultivator would say, I'll start earlier to be there on time. Simple, effective. So these are, this is the comparison and contrast between the two. Now, this all goes into the overall category of overcoming yourself. Why? Because we're the best at deceiving ourselves by using excuses so that we don't have to do anything, so that we avoid challenging ourselves. But in life, it is absolutely necessary for us to challenge ourselves to go through some difficult times in order to grow as a person. So to talk about that, Dow masters will often use the example of a specific example of a butterfly emerging from its cocoon. So the story usually goes like, once there was a boy who loved butterflies. He thought they were simply amazing. I mean, look at the wings, the intricate designs, the colors. What wonderful creatures. And one day, the little boy found a cocoon, and he knew that a beautiful butterfly would emerge from it. So he took it home in order to be able to watch it happen with his own eyes, to witness this miracle happening with his own eyes. Because the transformation of the butterfly is also amazing, just like the beauty of the butterfly. So he waited for quite a few days, and one day he saw that there was a rip, a small tear in the cocoon. And he saw the butterfly struggling to whiten the tear to get out. So the little boy sat there watching the butterfly struggle with this process. And he waited a long time. The progress was very slow. The butterfly seemed to be stuck. The bu butterfly, the little boy imagined that the butterfly was frustrated and in pain because it kept trying, but it wasn't getting very far. It seemed as if the butterfly was exhausted from the effort. It would slow down, it would pause, before, after a while, continuing again. So out of compassion, the little boy decided to help the butterfly. So he took a small blade, a small knife, and very carefully, he cut the cocoon without touching the butterfly. He wanted to enlarge the opening to make it easier for the butterfly to come out. So very carefully, very slowly, he proceeded to cut the cocoon to free the butterfly, he thought, to enable the butterfly to come out and spread its wings. But then what happened next was not quite right. The butterfly is able to come out, but it doesn't look right. It's got this massive bloated body. It's got small wings that could not spread. And the little boy, meaning well, wanting to free the butterfly from the struggle, has achieved the opposite effect. The, struggle, the butterfly that's been freed is not able to expand its wings into the beautiful wings that he loved so much. Its body remained bloated. It did not shrink to the size that he was expecting. Shortly thereafter, the butterfly died. So the reason why 
Dao masters tell that story is to emphasize that there's gonna be times in life when we too are struggling with a particular cocoon. We too need to transform and the growing process is not without discomfort. It can be quite a bit of a struggle. It can be exhausting. It can be painful. Now, if someone comes along like the little boy for the butterfly and makes it easy for us, perhaps initially we would be grateful. But that may also be robbing us of the opportunity to grow from the experience. So this is why the story of emergence is fitting with the overall theme of overcoming the self. We go through these difficult challenges, it's hard. We have to overcome that. We have to overcome our tendency to want to give up in order to grow, in order to be stronger, more beautiful, more free, more miraculous, more wonderful. So with that, I think you would agree with me that overcoming yourself, private victory, known only to you and those closest to you, that the butterfly coming out of the cocoon, emergence is a suitable symbol for that part of it. So what about the last part? To proceed vigorously. This is about the journey of life. A life well lived is the ultimate victory. It's the greatest triumph of all. So how do we depict that? How do we, how do we show, how do we illustrate this principle? So the conventional thinking, again, will work from conventional to Dell cultivation. So as I go through life, I'm observing people, I talk to people and I see that many people still aren't sure where they are going in life. And this may be uh, very applicable to many of us listening to this, to this presentation. So they may say, well, I can't predict what will happen years from now. So I'm just gonna take it one day at a time. Or they may say, I haven't really found anything that resonates with me. I hear this all the time. Now here's the risk. If you continue this way, without studying the Tao, without understanding how this particular Tao works, what can happen is that you end up living a life defined by external factors. Work, retirement, societal expectations, media, other people's agenda, external factors that you bow down to, which is the illusion that the warrior faced. So rather than to live life on your own terms, you live life in accordance with others. Now, what about Tao cultivation? So first, cultivators of the authentic Tao don't go with the flow, as some may assume. It's very popular to think that Tao cultivation is about that, going with the flow. But when you, when you study the Tao in depth, you discover that Tao cultivators don't let themselves be carried away by the currents. That's not going with the flow. To go with the flow in the Tao is to surf the wave of life, is to adjust yourself and work with the wave so you can do whatever you want as you are having a blast. So rather than to go with the flow, Tao cultivators see themselves as being on a sacred journey. And the story also from the Zhuangzi is the giant pain bird flying high in the sky, flying thousands of miles to the Southern Sea. So this 
this is uh, this story is full of symbolism. The Seven Sea represents the highest aspiration for the Dao Code Waiter who's flying high in the sky. So let's uh, talk about that in more detail. So the expression in Mandarin is Peng Chen Wan Li. And here's the uh, opinion for that, Peng Chen Wan Li. And literally, uh, Peng, the first character, is the name of this giant bird. Cheng, the second character, means journey or trip. Third character, one, means 10,000, or just means many and all. And then last character, li, that's a measure of distance. So we usually translate that as miles. So as I mentioned, the Southern Sea, where the giant bird is flying to, that represents the aspiration of the Dao cultivator. So now the question is, what is your aspiration? I get that it's not difficult. Uh, it's not, I should say, easy. It's not easy to figure out what your life should be all about. If you haven't discovered it yet, this could be one of the most difficult questions you have to tackle. So I want to suggest that you can get closer to the answer by asking yourself some key questions. Key questions including, what is most important to you? What is the most important thing to you in life? Or what are the most important things to you in life? So think about that for a moment. Then, what are your deepest values? Values that you hold most dear. So these are questions that I hope if you have already figured out what your life is all about, you may be in a position to advise other people to discover what their lives are supposed to be about. If that is the case, I want to suggest that you also get them to respond to these questions. So here's another one. What represents the best in you? What can you offer that is special and different? And lastly, what is the best way for you to serve? For me, the last question is the most significant of all. And when I think about the last question, the best way for me to serve, well, that's my mission in life. So my mission is to do everything I possibly can to help as many people as possible discover the best path for them in life, to stay on that path, to enjoy their journey on the path. That's my mission. That speaks to me. That resonates with me. Your mission is going to be different. Well, well it could be the same. You could decide to work on the same mission with me, which would be very much welcome. But everybody is different, so I'm not going to assume that your mission is the same as mine. So food for thought, please take a look, um, either attempt to answer the questions yourself or help someone else uh, answer those questions. So when you know where you are flying to, like a giant pain bird, it's exhilarating. It's a breakthrough moment. In the story written by Zhuang Zi, the symbolic significance is that a giant fish in the ocean transforms into a giant bird and then shoots up in the sky. So the bird flying up higher and higher is leaving the ocean far below. So in terms of life, 
as you are flying to your own southern sea, your own destination, the height of your cruising altitude is the height of your aspiration. It's a measure of how powerfully your aspiration speaks to you. Another element, another important element from the story by Zhuangzi is that at the ground level, there are little birds and insects who have no clue where you are flying to. They can't figure out why you are flying at all. I mean, it seems like such a major undertaking. It looks like it might be exhausting. It's beyond the conception of the little birds and insects, what you are trying to accomplish. So the little birds and insects, these represent the critics, the negative people in your life, the naysayers, the Debbie Downers, I think is the expression, or the, to make it not gender specific, perhaps the, also the Donald Downers, I don't know. So the negative people, the pessimists, those who discourage. So here's the key that Johnson mentions about handling your critics. If you are high enough in the sky, you cannot hear the birds and insects at ground level. Translating that to life, it means that if you have a sense of mission, if you're on a mission, you're on fire and you're proceeding vigorously to your destination, what the critics say will bounce right off you. They have no, if, no impact, no effect on you at all. Conversely, if you are distracted by the critics, it just means you're too low, you're not high enough. You have to go higher. And that means either you amp it up, find a greater goal, find one that speaks to you more, find one that fires you up, excites you, find a different destination that is more exciting, then that will be the elements that requires you to go higher. And when you go higher, you will no longer hear the critics or you can't make out what they're saying, which is another way to talk about how people are being negative to you and it has no impact on you whatsoever. So this is about, this is all about traveling vigorously. So when you're on your sacred journey, there are things that happen as if by magic. So on a day-to-day -day basis, every day is filled with purpose. You're never without a purpose. You always know what you, what you have to do. Even when you're not working on your aspiration at a moment, you know that you will, you will return to working on it sooner or later. Here's another thing that I find. Having a destination helps you make difficult choices. So specifically, what I mean by that is that when you figure out your highest values, your, your deepest, most um, compelling goals that you have about life, you can align the rest of your life along with that. So when you find yourself facing a dilemma, you don't know which way to go. You can bring in your values, your goal, your destination, and you can evaluate with that in mind. Choice A or choice B? Well, which one gets me closer to my, to my life mission, to my goal in this lifetime? I find that it's very handy for me in making difficult choices in choosing from the one that will get me closer to where I want to go. So that's our discussion on proceeding vigorously using the story of Zhuangzi that Zhuangzi wrote in The Giant Pain Bird as our template, as our example. So now we have another slide with that same blue background. So the, this starts out with overcoming others, 
and that's Sun Tzu, what we call the art of war. Then we have overcome yourself. Here we're using the struggle of the butterfly to transform, to emerge from the cocoon as a metaphor for that. Then finally, about the journey of life. Here we are using the giant pain bird flying majestically toward the southern sea as the symbol for us. So this ends our discussion, uh, including the hidden structure that's uh, not so obvious at first glance of 33. We're now ready to get into the paraphrase. So usually in the past, uh, we end up not having enough time to do the paraphrase and have to do it at the beginning of discussing the next chapter. Today, I'm very happy to see that we have, we have enough time to do this and then we can, do, we can uh, bring back those blue sides for the, for the summary uh, for additional reinforcement of those basic concepts. So let's start, and we'll do this two lines at a time, just like the original. The original is composed of eight lines, but there are four sets of two lines each. So we start out with those who understand others are intelligent, those who understand themselves are enlightened. Um, this is one of those examples in the Tao Te Ching that does not require a whole lot of paraphrasing, even as it is. I mean, these two lines are perfect. We can use them. We can use them for, uh, for the paraphrase as it is. But if we wanted to add a little bit more to it, we can. So incorporating all the stuff that we talked about, we can do something like this. Those who understand others may be intelligent, but those who understand themselves are the ones possessing true wisdom. They are at a level above, for they wield the power of the true self. So having heard the line by line, the examples, the illustrations, I think, I think this makes sense to you. Let's continue on to the next two lines. Those who overcome others have strength. Those who overcome themselves are powerful. So again, just like the first two lines, these two lines are pretty good all by themselves, easy to understand. There's not a whole lot of need to paraphrase them into something else. Whereas you guys have seen lines from the Tao Te Ching that are very cryptic and benefit greatly from a paraphrase. So here we could just leave them alone, but then we could also do what we did uh, for lines one and two in similar fashion bring in all the stuff that we talked about to add some additional color to it. Not really necessary, but I think a lot of fun. Those who can overcome others may be formidable warriors possessing great strength, but those who can overcome themselves are the ones possessing the true power of the spirit, the power of the authentic Tao. So here, we're making a distinction between external physical strength and internal spiritual strength. And then five and six are not as easily rolling off the tongue as one, one and two, three and four. Those who know contentment are wealthy. That's actually a pretty good line standalone. Uh, these, by the way, I think that lines one to five can all serve as great quotes for those internet memes, those graphics that have quotes. Most of those quotes are misquotes that there are things that Lao Tzu never said. But quoting these lines 
you know, one, one and two, three and four, or just line five by itself, these would all be very accurate as having been written by Laozi. So those who know contentment are wealthy, those who perceive vigorously have willpower. So you saw an example of the pain bird uh, when we talk about proceeding vigorously. So how do we bring them together in a paraphrase? Well, here's what I would suggest. Those who know contentment are the ones who possess real wealth rather than mere accumulations of material things. Those who know where they are going and move forward with purpose are the ones who possess true determination. So these two lines follow similar um, pattern as the previous four lines and make a further distinction that it's not just about the, the accumulation of material things, you can possess a lot of material things and feel that it's not enough, in which case you have the mindset of poverty, insufficiency. And then the original is talking about willpower, determination, Determination is actually a pretty good translation for the last character of line six. And the last, that last character is also about aspiration and setting, setting up goals. So everything that we have talked about is extremely accurate. So finally, the, the last two lines. Those who do not lose their base endure those who die but do not perish have longevity. So this really ties everything together. You, you look at the previous six lines, it's about the people who do this or do that, the, you know, the characteristics, and we talked about how we can break them out into the three characteristics of true wisdom, you know, knowing the self, knowing others, and knowing contentment. And then we also talked about the three characteristics of the triumphant, you know, to defeat others, to defeat oneself, and to to uh, have that ultimate victory in traveling the journey of life. This line seven and, uh, and line eight is another way to summarize it, that as you do all of the above, that you hold on to your base or your foundation built from the Tao, so that you can be as lasting as the Tao is eternal. And then lastly, those who die but do not perish have longevity, that if you live a meaningful life, you can count on people remembering you when you're gone. And it isn't so much that the goal should be to be remembered by people, to live on in people's memories. The goal is just to live your life right and to be remembered, being remembered by other people once you have passed on that is simply the natural consequence of you having lived right. So here's the paraphrase for the last two lines. Those who hold on to their foundation of Tao spirituality are the ones who will last. Those who have passed away but continue to live on in everyone's memory are the ones who possess true longevity. Indeed, this is also true, this is also the context of immortality in the Tao, to last beyond one's physical death. Nothing to do with extension of the number of years that we will live, although when you practice the Tao, that too is a natural consequence. So now it's time for the summary. And the summary uh, this time is composed of two slides. Both are the blue slides that you saw before, representing mini summaries. Together, they are the complete summary for this chapter. So the first one is about the three aspects 
of knowing or understanding. So here they are again. This is just here to summarize and remind everyone. As we go through this, um, I want everyone to remember the story about Xinzai and remember the very specific style of communication that I would like to challenge everybody to practice. That as you converse with other people, clear your minds and thoughts of any self-centric notions. Try, you know, think about how, once I point out to you the autobiographical uh, communication, you will find, you will find it everywhere. And I hope that you will detect it in yourself as well. You know, are you filtering what other people say with your autobiography? If so, please stop. Instead, put the emphasis on the other side. What are they feeling? What do they mean? What are they trying to accomplish? What are their plans? So by you reflecting them uh, to go deeper with them, you will find that you understand people far better. You will also find that you are very different from anyone else who talks to them because the self-centric communication style is far, far more prevalent. So this will, this will give you a remarkable edge. You will gain the ability to influence other people even though that is not your goal. Second, understand yourself. This takes us back to the puzzle of the warrior. So the warrior wielding the sword does not have to listen to the king, the high priest, or the rich man. The warrior representing you is the authority. You are the authority unto yourself. This is the message of the Dao De Jing, Dao De Jing as well, that you are sovereign that you possess the power to choose for yourself. And then lastly, no contentment. That brings us back to the story of So Lucky. And that was the story of a shopkeeper who was always joyous, always thinking about and grateful for the luck that she had in her life. And because of that, she attracted good things, positive things, and she was happy and content. And she felt that way, despite the difficulties that other people might complain about. So drawing inspiration from that, the challenge for everyone is to look at your life can you feel contentment about your life? Can you be joyous about everything that you already possess? And what a remarkable thing it is that we live in this day and age with access to so much information, with connection to so many people through the internet. How lucky, or I should say in the, in the lingo of the story, we are so lucky. Moving on, let's talk about overcoming, winning, being victorious, triumphant. We start out with overcoming others. And we talked about the connection between this particular uh, idea or concept with the first two items in the previous slide that when you know yourself and when you know others, then you win 100 victories out of 100 battles. That's from Sun Tzu. Then we also used the, the example of the butterfly to talk about overcoming yourself. And the reason why I wanted to use the butterfly is to point out that uh, you literally are like the butterfly, struggling to get out of a cocoon, struggling to transform. And I use the word struggle intentionally because I know the process 
may not be easy. I know that you can have struggles, discomfort, pain, exhaustion as you work through a process. That's normal. That uh, I want to make sure everyone keeps the image of the beautiful butterfly at the end of the process in mind. That is what you can look forward to when you have completed your own transformation. That is the most meaningful victory of all, a private victory where you have overcome yourself. And lastly, tying everything together, we have the pain bird. So I want to reference back to the Tao of Success, uh, one of the books that I have out there, that the very first story is about the pain bird. It goes into details about the different metaphors, the different symbols that are being used. And I'm also happy to hear from people who have read that story and say that the pain bird is working great. That book, The Tao of Success, is divided into five big parts, five rings of destiny, starting from the innermost ring, expanding outward. And the pain bird is, is the first lesson in that when it, when it comes to embarking on the journey of life. So if you haven't seen it yet, I would, I would like to suggest holiday season is upon us. This may be the time to give yourself a present or perhaps other people. Either way, the, the gift of proactive initiative to travel vigorously in life, that I would say is the best gift that you can give to yourself. So that's the pain bird. Our meeting has come to an end, but the journey continues on. Let us travel safely. Until next time, may the Tao fill you with peace and happiness.